Big show for you today. We're going to talk about the bullpen. Seth Lugo's down. Justin Wilson's going to the Bronx. Are the Mets still interested in dumping potentially familiar Betances, or is that ship sailed? And is Trevor Rosenthal available to them? Also, what is going on in center field? A couple potential gold glove type guys, but they're both right-handed hitters. Will they mean anything for Brandon Nimmo's playing time? And are they out on Jackie Bradley Jr.? Shane, anything starts now. Hey everybody, welcome to the Shane Anything Podcast. It's Doug Williams and Andy Martino with you today. A reminder to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts, as well as rate and review. Uh, Mets Hot Stove tomorrow is at a special time of 5 o'clock, which means Baseball Night in New York is at an extra special time at 4.30. That's Wednesday. Uh, Luis Rojas is scheduled to appear uh, tomorrow, so you'll hear from uh, the Mets' second-year manager Again, Mets Hot Stove, special time Wednesday night, 5 o'clock, Baseball Night in New York on at 4.30. Andy, how are you doing? Oh, not great. Um, I had a uh, uh, some dental work today, and I'm still a little number than I would like on the left side. So uh, that's kind of the forefront of my mind. How are you? I didn't have dental work done, um, but I'm fine. Uh, you know, just... Today was nice Tuesday for everybody listening because the weather was nice mm-hmm. and I went for a little walk and the actual sun was out, which was, it was good to see it. Um, it had been a while. Good to catch up with an old friend. Um, so one, I, I guess the, the first topic about the Mets that I want to uh, talk about is center field, Andy, because um, the Almora signing, I think, had a little bit of intrigue to it because it came around the time we were starting to talk about Jackie Bradley Jr. after Springer signed in Toronto. The Almora signing and the Mets' interest in Almora was something you had reported on for a long time before it actually happened. I think some of that helped maybe make that signing seem more important than it was. Not that he's not a solid player, but just salary-wise, he's making just over a million, like two times the minimum. So, like... I'm not sure that means he has to be a big leaguer. I'm not sure he still has an option. I'm not sure it means he's going to play a lot of center field for the Mets. Then last night you reported the Kevin Pillar uh, signing between the Mets and, and his side. And that's a little bit more of a substantial deal, but he's 32. He's uh, metrics wise, defensively, not the player he once was. Should I view those two guys or Pilar specifically maybe as center field being done? Uh, probably. Um, I, I, I would say the Bradley thing uh, is – was we've talked about this before, Doug, but we talk about all oh, the Bradley thing started to come up or be more relevant more. I'm not saying you said anything inaccurate, but like – obviously, but like the Bradley thing didn't really – do anything. It was just fans talking about, Hey, it would be cool to get Jackie Bradley. So we talked about it a lot and Jim and I did reporting on his price and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, he was in, he was in the, in the ether, but that doesn't mean that the Mets were ever really that um, serious about getting him in a world without the DH. Uh, if something happens with the DH sometime soon and Bradley's still unsigned, I guess the Mets could go back there. That was always the thought they would need a DH to, to, to do Bradley. And they, they were just always have been always kind of lukewarm on him um, at the price at least. So that's kind of where that is. And now as it stands, they have three left-handed hitting starting outfielders, right. And two right-handed hitting backup outfielders. So it's a little bit of balance. You've got a couple of guys who have started in the big leagues uh, before, especially Pilar. Um, when I, we go back to this again, when, Baseball operations departments say East Coast Dodgers. They don't mean we sign Mookie Betts to a $300 million contract. They mean that one through 26 now on the roster and also like 26 through, you know, 30 something are really good. Like how the Dodgers, a Mets person said this to me earlier in the off season, the Dodgers win that division every year on 20 through 25 on their roster. You know, like they, if somebody goes down, they usually have somebody pretty good to replace that person. So the idea of signing pretty good players for bench roles um, fits the philosophy that the Mets have pursued. Yeah. And it's not just the 20 through 26. It's also like find 
being a Max Muncy. And that's something the Dodgers are good at. And, yeah. you know, there are, I, I don't care how big of a Met fan you are. You know, I report on the team every day, as do you. Um, well, not report, but we do a show on it. Um, there are still guys, I comment, there are still guys on their roster that they've signed this offseason that I forget about. Um, like they have a Rodas Vizcaino. They have Brandon Drury. Mm-hmm. Um, and we talk a lot about pitching depth, but I th- and I, I do still think that that's a, an, a, the Mets are an arm or two short on the starting pitching end. But um, they have done a really good job of paying guys potentially to go to Syracuse. And that's something that good franchises do, which is, you know, minor leaguers don't mean cheap players. They, they might mean guys that step in and play a huge role for you in July, August, and September. So that point is well taken. Um, I guess from the center field perspective, Andy, like, do you think Sandy is, is looking at Jackie Bradley Jr. and thinking this is only worth it if we have the DH? And do you think that that says – uh, something about his interest in the player? Like, don't you think if he yeah. loved the player, he would make a role for him no matter what? Yeah, again, yeah, for sure. The Jackie Bradley conversation has always been more external to the Mets, media fans, than it has been, like, internally in their meetings, like, really being serious about that player. Uh, of course they've considered it. Of course they've talked to Boris. And this is where we get into that semantic game of, like, talks, in talks, checked in. I don't know. If anyone's telling you that the Mets are like in talks with Jackie Bradley, Bradley or have been, that's probably a little bit uh, exaggerated from, from what I've been told. It, they've always been like, yeah, we could sign them, but I don't know. We'll see how it falls. And, and, and yeah, probably would require the, the universal DH. Um, even with that, I'm not sure. We'll, we'll see what happens and what they do with pitching. There used to be a day where it's crazy to think, but that stage of the off season process was something we were unaware of. We were probably better for it. Like the semantics that you're talking about the Mets just by doing due diligence, just by existing with a high payroll are in talks with, I would imagine pretty much every free agent out there um, or have been, have been in touch. You could say all these things. Um, you know, until there ends up being traction, that's when you should really start listening closely to people like Andy or Ken Rosenthal or Jeff Passan. Um, that's when it starts to matter. Uh, but, you know, I remember, I won't get specific into the story, Andy, this is kind of behind the scenes, but like in the past couple of weeks and months, there's been, there was a time where somebody reported something like the Mets are really interested in this player as like a big bombshell. And you were like, yeah, I can't imagine that's not true. I mean, that's a good player. Like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I know, I, I just don't oh, want to get into yeah, specifics of the story, but like that, <laughs> that is part of your job to be like, yeah, the, the Mets are interested in a good player. That's, I don't know why that's news, but sure. It's well, true. it's like, news because I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I think it's only news because um, it's, it, it's new. Like they haven't Brody dabbled with this to his credit, especially in his first off season. So it, it's not brand new for the Mets, but the idea that they're going to be kind of in on almost everybody and checking in is, is good. And it's what their fans I think want under the Cohen thing, the downside of it and the way it plays out is that there's a way to say this where, well, you were in on Springer, you didn't get Springer, you're in on Bauer, you didn't get Bauer, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, you could list them and be like, why are the Mets missing on everyone? It's like, well, they're, they're in the game on just about everybody and landing. I think they've signed nine free agents, including Stroman. Um, I'd have to double check that, but I think nine major league contracts, obviously way more minor league depth. Uh, so yeah, they're, they are in on just about everybody. Um, but that doesn't I, mean they come to an agreement. That's a good point that you make because there is that spin. Yesterday we led BNNY with the, just the question, did the Mets have a bad weekend? Uh, separating the Seth Lugo news, which was a big blow, obviously, to the team. But things are speeding up because we're it's the week of pitchers and catchers. So, you know, you saw Justin Wilson go to the Yanks. Uh, Jake Arrieta, which I know you tweeted that Mets fans didn't seem too enthused about that, but that was someone they were in on. He goes back to the Cubs. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just there are targets going off the board. And you start to want, you know, James Paxton goes back to his former team in the Mariners. And you wonder... Maybe Mets fans, if you go through that list, weren't wild about any particular player, but when four or five players get signed by other teams that the Mets were connected to on Twitter, 
then you start to wonder, hmm, why why aren't the Mets signing all these guys? Do, you know, can't Steve Cohen afford literally any player he wants? What like why are we holding back from getting better? You know? Well, did you, they don't, did you think they had a bad weekend by not um, signing those guys? No, I think no, I think the Lugo thing was the only real bad news over the I mean, it would have been nice to have Wilson, but I don't know. I mean, I think that other than that, I, they are. I, I just, I, I guess I don't, they certainly wouldn't see it that way because they would see it as we made choices to get better. Like we would only, we would only, we valued this player at a certain number and we weren't going to go too much over that number. Or we were in this trade talk, but we weren't comfortable with the ask and the prospect cost or whatever it is. Um, that's, I mean, so the, I, I guess if we were in the Mets baseball ops zoom and, and pose that question, they'd be like, what do you mean? We are making us better. Like, or, or at least we're trying to, you know, it's not like they're just like, Hey, Sandy, Zach, um, Jake Arietta wants to play for you. Justin Wilson, uh, this guy, the other guy, the other guy. And they're like, no, thanks. We're just going to go back to sleep. It's obviously like a calculation on the merits of each individual player. Right. Right. It's not that the Mets were trying, like, I, I, I don't know. I just think, you hear Rich Hill, the Mets have interest in Rich Hill. And I think Matt fans out there, uh, you know, go to his baseball reference and they're like, wow, you know, this guy's old and he doesn't pitch that much, but when he does, he's really good. This would make sense. This is low leverage, uh, you know, potentially like really good four or five guy. And then he goes to the race. Uh, James Paxton is pitched in New York. He's kind mm-hmm. of off injured, but again, three or four guy for you. Like that's pretty good. And he signs a pretty affordable contract in Seattle. And so you're starting to wonder, like, what is it? What is it that's not, you know, alluring these players? Like, what? I don't think it's anything. I don't, I think we're trying to connect dots in a conversation like that that, that aren't there. It's right. just like each individual situation happens in its individual way, whether the player has a preference, the offer. A lot of times, the, the missing piece when we don't understand a free agency choice uh, is a, is, are the medicals. Teams have the medical records on these players and no ethical executive is going to say publicly, you know what? We didn't sign this player because frankly, we looked at the most recent x-ray or MRI of his elbow and shoulder and they look atrocious. We're we're not spending $8 million on that. Uh, That happens a lot. Uh, You know, so I, I think it's, we definitely don't know that anyone except for Trevor Bauer chose to not sign with the Mets, you know, like as a decision. Uh, we have no idea what all the factors were that went into all these things, but we know that we don't have enough information to fully evaluate it. I try to get as much as I can. And if you catch me suggesting that, Hey, maybe the medicals on a player a factor, maybe I'm trying to, you know, make a point without like ruining that player's, you know, financial viability, like, which is not my job to do, but I think there are always reasons why these things didn't work. I don't know. The Mets had a real problem with the idea that they, lost out on Springer. I mean, fairly or unfairly, they thought that, um, no, we set a price and then the Blue Jays went crazy on it. We didn't want that. So, right. You know. If there's one piece of advice I could give out there to the listener, because I'm, I'm, if, if you're listening to this, I'm probably closer to you than I am to somebody like Andy in terms of like sources and knowledge of these given situations behind closed doors. Listen really closely to when people like Andy or, as I said, Ken Rosenthal, uh, Jeff Passant, when these guys answer questions, because sometimes they'll give you a little nugget, whether it's accidental or on purpose, that may not be uh, presented like breaking news. But like you can learn a lot by what sounds like or what they say is speculation. I'm just putting it out there. Yeah, that can be true because there are times when – um, we know things that are not entirely worth the battle. Mm-hmm. Like I could tell you that so and so is, um, like it was when I it's when I didn't want to say Jackie Bradley's asking price at one point because I was like I think we actually had this conversation. Yeah, because he here. wanted ten years, three hundred million, and you didn't feel right. comfortable telling our audience that. And it was like I just I don't want to do. Scott Boris puts out a statement about my report and MLB trade rumors is all over it. And dah, dah, dah. it's just like, you know, life's hard enough. We don't need, we don't need that kind of drama. So sometimes we do bury our nuggets. <laughs> well, one, one nugget 
that you didn't bury was during the like uh, three team prospect trade that the Mets were involved in last week that ended up with Andrew Benintendi in uh, Kansas city. You reported that I, I don't think this is what's going on, but the Mets are looking at potential salary dumps with Jerry's familiar and down Batances with Seth Lugo looking like may uh, optimistically do you think that that idea is now ditched uh, mm. of ditching those, those contracts? It's a good question. Um, I don't have that specifically, that information, but that'd be a good question to ask for sure. I, that, it would make sense. And they released Brad Brock too, obviously. So those are two arms uh, that they don't have, one by choice and one by injury. So yeah, perhaps that would make it less likely to, to uh, trade a reliever. I don't know, though. If you can get someone to take Jerry's Familia's contract, I think you should probably jump at that. Yeah, I mean, I, again, this is where, and I think we're going to do this on the show tonight, just to highlight the, the names that you don't even really realize might make a big difference. And Miguel Castro is another one of those guys because, you know, that was kind of a, a low-profile trade that brought him over. And, you know, that's a guy who, who, when he's good is really good and, and mm-hmm. might be, you know, if he pitches well in 2021, which he very well could, then, you know, that's part of the reason Sandy might still have the confidence in his group to, to still go ahead and trade down Batances and Jay Reese Familia. I, f- I feel like those guys with power arms that can't have trouble throwing strikes. You just, you wait for a couple of years for them to put it together. They don't. And then you non tender them like, it's like, oh, but he throws so hard. It's like, yeah, but have you, yeah, seen the game, you know, it's like that's I, why that's why the Mets have a Rodis Viscaino after he was right. the Braves closer for a little that's while. Right. That's right. You know, it's no, it was well, another and, one of those is Hansel Robles. I know he had like a good minute with the Angels, but I was like, oh, this guy, he's got such an arm. It's like, well, yeah, but like doesn't throw a strike. So, right. And team, teams will keep uh, taking risks after they're non tendered or released or traded or whatever because they throw hard. You want to keep capitalizing you want him to finally find it when he's on your team um and you know Hansel Robles will just keep pointing at the sky uh as balls are hit 400 feet off of him um Justin Wilson Andy that I goes into the previous conversation Mets fans are like this guy was rock solid here Mm -hmm. and he goes back to the other team in New York which also happens to be a former team of his why why were the Mets not more interested uh, I don't know. <laughs> I know that the Yankees. <laughs> the last were, two, the well, last two questions I've asked you, you've really been. It's well, like I, you're in the team's PR. You're like, well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, and, uh, it's like you're, I'm yeah, not, you're like an athlete. Not doing PR with the Mets. I'm just saying, look, I, 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 it may not have been that kind of a binary choice. I know that the Yankees offered them an interesting deal. That's, I don't have the exact numbers, but I think it's around four million for the year. And then there's some creative structuring and some kind of second year option or vest type situation um, uh, that was going to guarantee him more, I think, than the Mets. Uh, so there could be that. And there's also differences in evaluation. I know I let off saying I don't know, but I do have some information here. I know that the these could be the difference of two uh, scouting departments, the Yankees had Wilson over Aaron Loop on their board. Um, I can tell you for a fact. And the Mets, I believe, had Loop over Wilson. So I guess we'll find out who's right in a couple of months. But um, it's literally just like one group of baseball operations people on their Zoom ranks it one way, the other on it, does it another way. And that, that's I think the, that's all that happened. That is the type of information that I wish more people were aware of. Like – teams view players differently. Like, you know, I think if I didn't know that, I would think Aaron loop was a downgrade from Justin Wilson, but the Mets don't think that, which is why they signed him. Like teams disagree on players. And um, I don't know. I just think the the more you dig into these stories and it's easy to uh, take the um, kind of talk radio opinion with all this and be like, you know, the, and, and by the way, if we had our friend Salicata on the podcast, you know, he would be very down on the Mets offseason right now. And he makes, you know, some good nuanced points as well. It's not that you're either a smart or you're an idiot. Um, mm-hmm. It's that there's just 
deeper reasons why you should look into the reasons why the Mets have done what they've done. And um, right. they might be right. They might be wrong, but um, obviously they're not asleep with the switch. You know, they have, there's a, there's the thought process at work and we'll just see, you know, the Yankees might be right or wrong too on, on Wilson. We'll, we'll just see. First yeah. year Wilson was here. He was hurt. A lot of the year he came back. He was great last year. He's pretty good. I mean, would have been a nice guy to keep around, but um, they like loop. James McCann, the, the Mets new catcher met with the media today, said the, the NL East is no joke. Um, and again, Andy, I think um, because we cover uh, pretty much 50% of the time we cover the Mets, we're, we're lucky to be covering then a division mm-hmm. that has every team could be very good. I mean, the, the, the Marlins made the playoffs last year and I know that they, I believe they finished under 500 in, um, you know, nine inning games or whatever. It was a fluky season, but they're really young and talented. The Braves are obviously the, you'd have to consider the perennial favorites The the nationals continue to add on that starting pitching that they have. Um, the Phillies have brought back some key pieces and then you have the Mets obviously. So where do you think the division shapes up right now? Well, first of all, I'm a little disappointed in the new guy. It would have been a lot more fun if James Mechanic come out of the gate saying the National League East is a joke. That, that would have been a more to chew on. Right, but uh, I think that's just objectively false. It would have been fun, though. That I mean, could have yeah. been like the, the Mets had this pitcher, Miguel Batista, during the dark, early Sandy years. Remember this? And one time I was there in Washington after like some meaningless game. The Mets just were out of it like for like five years. And this is in the middle of that. And Miguel Batista, who was like the long man, for some reason he did something in the game that that sent the reporters to his locker. And he was like, I, I believe we are the best team in baseball. And everyone's like, what? And he's like, he was, we're, just, we're the best team in baseball. And I mean, to this day, I don't know why he, why he thought that, but see that? That reminds me, one of the weirdest, honestly, it sticks out as one of the weirdest stories I've ever heard or even covered a little was the UConn football coach like five years ago, I think his name was Bob Diaco, mm-hmm. s- said that they were going to win the national championship. <laughs> the and I remember is. being like, <laughs> yeah, I just remember being like, you, you're, you're not even within the realm of possibility. <laughs> yeah. Like well. some, uh, maybe it's just like, you know, trying to speak things into existence. But anyway, division, James, Andy. Well, I wish James McCann had said something equally absurd, but since he didn't, we'll take a straightforward approach. Where do I think the NLE st- stacks up? Uh, I think it's the uh, Braves and the Mets at the top duking it out. We're going to have to see how uh, the baseball games uh, play out, what the results are. Oh, my God. <laughs> you are like towing the company line today with the cliche answer. No, you know what? I just this want them they, to take it one day at a time. I want them to stay uh, within themselves. Time but will look, tell. And. I think that there's two teams in that division that can, that are likely to contend for the division. I think um, it being bigger than that is probably um, would be overstated. I don't see the Phillies, the Marlins or the nationals as, as serious contenders. If anyone I had to pick from that group, I'd say the nationals have had a decent little off season um, quietly, uh, but those pitchers are getting older. Uh, they've got their championship. Uh, the Phillies are kind of in no man's land. The Marlins are on the, on the make. They've got a great farm system. They had a schedule last year. Uh, so, you know, it's an interesting organization to watch, but um, I just think it's going to be the Mets and the Braves. I think that normally you'd pick the Mets because the Braves play deep into the postseason. That is a distinct disadvantage most years. I actually think, and some baseball people think that I've talked to, it could be an advantage this year to have played into October Mm. because you're one of the only teams that got anything approaching, like stretched out, you know, remember the season was two months and the postseason was like a month. So if you're the Braves, remember that whole 2020? Yeah. Yeah. I remember. I remember. Yeah. Right. So we like the Braves got like a third more baseball almost than anybody else. So their pitchers actually probably have some more innings and to play with this stretched out a little more. So I like that about the Braves for their sake. And uh, like Ian Anderson was like a star by the end of the postseason. Like, yeah, they, they, that team built confidence. If the Dodgers weren't incredible, the Braves probably win the World Series last yeah. year. Like, they, they were that good. I mean, they were just on the cusp. And if they had Mike Soroka, maybe they win the World Series. So, yeah, they, it seemed like a more confident team at season end than yeah, at the beginning good. of the season. 
They're good. Um, Obviously, you have to like the rotation more than the Mets. I strongly agree with you, what you said earlier. The Mets are a starter short right now, probably. Uh, so um, if the Mets don't add to the rotation, you probably pick the Braves. But there's a reason other than just being a wise acre that I don't love predicting. I, I, I can tell you as a reporter, I can tell you what's happening, hopefully. But to tell you what's going to happen is trickier. Do the Mets – a couple quick hitters before we go. Between I let I would put signing Walker or Odorizzi in this category, and I would put a trade for Chris Bryant or something in this category. One more bigish move before the start of the season, yes or no? If you oh, what did I just say about predicting? Uh, I, I but would... no, this is different. Predicting whether a team finishes over five hundred or wins the NL East is different from predicting something that you have more knowledge about than I do. Yeah. I would say, um, yes, one more big ish thing, probably. Okay. I don't think it'll be Bryant. I think what the Mets have done more is maybe lay the groundwork for a little bit of interest, uh, for the, your face, post- your face is slowly disappearing off your camera. Well, I'm trying to back off, which I've been instructed to do, but now I'm too low. I don't know. Maybe I never sat in front of a computer before on zoom. Maybe I'm just learning Jeff our producer. That's what we always have to say, right? And shows you, they always say yeah. like, Jeff, our producer. Well, they Jeff's always- been like casually laughing for like half this podcast. I, we haven't been, and at times we have not been being funny. So I, I don't know what it he's must been be my head at, location but, in the shot. Yeah, I can't I, think of, yes, confirmed. Um, so you, I think, you yeah, don't think Bryant? I probably not. Uh, they, look, if they were, if they, I will say this, they have not been on, Rosenthal, Walker, or Odorizzi. If they are, it would be a change. Um, but I think that Sandy Alderson knows what a good baseball team looks like, and he knows he's pretty much got one but could use another pitcher. And possibly a third baseman, but not likely a third baseman. Um, it's just they want to win, so um, I expect them to figure something else out. All right, last two quick hitters. Uh, do we have the DH on opening day? Who I don't know. I, I don't know. I truly don't know. From and that's from that extensive reporting. Everything I can tell you on my reporting is a very hard no. So that that's what I'll say. No okay. chance. That's the reporting. But I have a hard time completely accepting that. Okay. And do you think we have a, a capacity crowd at City Field by the end of the World Series? So this end of the world series is happening at city field is the presumption i, I wanted to go that far so i i didn't want you to say i don't know about the end of the regular season but if the mets uh, make the world series i hope maybe. so i don't know that's dr fauci I, I i i read something where he said uh just just today that initially it had been april was the hope for most like non-symptomatic you know non-underlying condition regular adults like us to get vaccinated. And now he's pushing it to May or June, unfortunately, because of some of the rollout stuff. So what baseball can do on that, uh, obviously entirely dependent on, it would seem the vaccine process. So uh, that would be, that would be really nice though. I can tell you that um, last year was kind of almost like a weird adventure. Like, like, I don't mean that in any kind of good way because people were sick and dying. It was like, okay, we're in this crisis. Let's see what this weird season looks like. This year, it just feels tiresome. Like, can we just be normal, please? Somehow, universe, can this please just kind of be as normal as possible? Because we've all done the hunker down and watch 60 games with no crowd thing. And it was the right thing to do to keep it that limited. But aren't you just tired of it? Of all the yeah. weirdness? I'm so tired of it. And I like looking back on it as if it's uh, a period that is ending. Um, I know my, my mom is actually doing a collage of photos in our house of like, for whatever reason, different photos we took during the, the height of the pandemic from the, mm-hmm. the, this time last year to, to now. And, you know, I'm going through the, my photos thinking of once to send her. And, you know, it's just like a photo of our kitchen counter full of like Clorox wipes. Yeah. Like, I wish I didn't have to have those things on my phone, but like those photos are an accurate representation of just the weirdness um, that at some point I thought I need to take a picture of this because of how lucky I am to have all these Clorox wipes because I found them on walmart.com on like refresh, did refresh, you, refresh. Did you just so expose weird. yourself for hoarding wipes at a time when there were needier people? 
well, I, I don't know. I bought them on Walmart and I used all of them. Would you take a vaccine if you had like a doctor friend that would give it to you now, even though you don't qualify? That's with like a moral question of the day. It is a great moral question. I think generally I look at it like it's not wrong if you can get one. It's wrong, but it's wrong if somebody else can't. Well, grandma so like, can't for in a lot of cases. So don't you take that vaccine, Douglas. Well, but do it. Are are they you got to ask some questions, do some reporting. Are they giving me this vaccine because I'm special or because they have an extra? They're giving you the vaccine because they're your buddy. They're a doctor. They can do it. No, you're not doing that. No, I'm not doing that either. It would be very tempting, but, but you can't live with, you can't live with it. If they're, if they've got an extra vaccine, they're going to throw out. I'll take (laughs) it. It's like, I just, I wasn't going to use this. I'm not joking. That's happening, Andy. What? What do you mean that's happening? Oh, yeah, that's happening. There are apps right now that are being used uh, that will tell you when there's an extra appointment that's not taken at the end of the day somewhere and it'll book it for you. You can go get it. Wow. Like there, there are appointments that are being missed, uh, vaccines that are going bad that they're going to throw out there. That's happening. So that's I want the that shot. I was curious about. Maybe I need that app. All right. Well, good talk. Yeah, I'm sure we've gotten ourselves in trouble for a variety of reasons in the past <laughs> couple minutes. Um, all right, Andy, good stuff as always. Yep. Um, we will talk to you next week, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Shane Inc. podcast. Uh, talk to you soon.